guys and welcome back to my channel. This is episode 7 of the Tectonic Processes and Hazards series. Today we're going to be talking about governance and natural disasters. This is still part of inquiry question 2. I'm going to leave the links down below to my notes that I have made all from this textbook here. I'm going to leave them down below for you, feel free to download them, do as you will. Please subscribe down below, like this video if you learnt something new and let's get into it. Community infrastructures and housing depends on good planning. Not all governments can enforce earthquake proof buildings or planning regulations that enforce them. A good deal be can be done before a disaster occurs through planning and preparedness. Good financial management and decision making also enable aid and donations to reach the right people when they need it. Let's contrast these places. This is going to be a case study heavy video. So we're going to talk about Japan, China and Haiti. They are all located on tectonic plate margins, which makes them all vulnerable to natural hazards. In recent decades, each country has experienced a powerful earthquake, yet the death toll and level of destruction has been hugely varied. Let's talk about Haiti first. Haiti is located on a fault between the North American and Caribbean plates. On 12th of January 2010, a magnitude 7.0 earthquake struck near the capital. The high death and injured toll made it one of the deadliest earthquakes on record. Why was this so deadly? So it had a shallow focus of 13 kilometres deep. Liquefaction, looser soil, caused many buildings to sink. The epicentre was only 24 kilometres from Port-au-Prince, which is the capital and the most densely populated city. Port-au-Prince is a developing city and it has limited resources that were being spent on immediate issues rather than disaster preparedness. There are also high levels of corruption at national and local government levels. The lack of building controls and regulations. There was also a lack of earthquake proof buildings. There was also a complete absence of disaster preparedness. Many Haitians were also living in poverty, so didn't have the resources to cope with the earthquake. So how did this impact Haiti? Most of Haiti's infrastructure was already poor and severely damaged during the earthquake. It only had one airport and few main roads. When these were damaged, crucial supplies were unable to get where it needed. A quarter of government officials were killed and government buildings were completely destroyed, making the government even less able to organise recovery and release efforts. By October 2010, so 10 months later, an outbreak of cholera occurred. By 2015, over 9,000 Haitians had been killed and 72,000 had been affected. The recovery effort. Internationally, 13 billion US dollars had been donated. However, most of this laid in the hands of intergovernmental organisations and governments. There were also later concerns about political corruption and mismanagement. There was an unwillingness to channel aid money into the Haitian government directly probably due to its high levels of corruption. By 2015, 80,000 Haitians were still living in temporary housing or camps. So this was five years later and people were still living in temporary accommodation. New buildings, roads and schools had all been built and health statistics had actually improved. And there are still signs that the Haitian government is getting stronger and more able to cope with natural threats. So we're going to touch quickly on the pressure and release model. This looks at the underlying causes of a disaster. It's based on the idea that disaster happens when two opposing forces interact. On one side, the process itself that creates vulnerability, and on the other side, the hazard itself. It starts with root causes, and through a series of processes called dynamic pressures, these root causes can lead to unsafe conditions. This process, from root to unsafe conditions is called the progression of vulnerability. I'm going to insert something here. If you want to read a little bit more into this, just pause this video and have a read of what this says. It is just the pressure and release model. Next country we're going to talk about on our list is China. In May 2008, a 7.9 magnitude earthquake hit. Over 45.5 million people in 10 provinces in the region were affected and 5 million people were made homeless. The earthquake also triggered landslides that led to a quarter of earthquake-related deaths. Both Haiti and Sichuan in China experienced devastating earthquakes that resulted in huge numbers of deaths, 
injuries and structural damage. Before both quakes, corrupt governments had often ignored building codes and accepted bribes to allow builders to take shortcuts. The effects of the corruption were particularly prominent in Sichuan and thousands of schools fell down, killing 5,335 children while government buildings remained standing. The damage of Sichuan was concentrated in rural areas and small towns, unlike the densely populated Port-au-Prince in Haiti, which may explain the reason in the difference in death toll. China had the money available to pay for rescue and aid efforts. This was a quicker recovery process than Haiti. China's central government was quickly able to respond effectively to the disaster. Within hours, 13,000 soldiers and rescue workers were sent to the area. Medical services were quickly restored. People in danger from landslides were quickly relocated. And within two weeks, temporary homes, roads and buildings were being built. At a national level, China had tougher building codes. It invested in safer buildings and had the resources to quickly respond to a hazard event. At the root level, however, the corruption of the local government and law enforcement meant that unsafe building practice still continued. In the longer term, the Chinese government saw the 2008 earthquake as an opportunity to rebuild the area from scratch. 97% of the 29,704 reconstruction projects in the region had started. 99% of the 196,000 farmhouses destroyed were rebuilt and 216 transport projects were under construction or had been completed. Country number three, Japan. On March 2011, a 9.0 magnitude earthquake struck under the Pacific Ocean, 100 kilometers east of Sendai, on the east coast of the Japanese island Honshu, resulting in seawater displacement that caused a tsunami to spread in all directions at hundreds of kilometers an hour. The wave reached 10 meters in some places, and splurged up to 10 kilometres inland. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant was severely damaged and led to dangerous levels of radiation in the air. Today, there is still a 20 kilometre exclusion zone around Fukushima. Despite the higher magnitude, there were fewer deaths and injuries in Japan than Haiti and Sichuan. Japan's preparation. As a highly developed country, Japan had the financial resources and commitment to prepare for a hazard event. There was good building construction. 75% of the buildings in Japan are constructed with earthquakes in mind. There were low levels of corruption and building regulations were being strictly enforced. There were also well-developed disaster plans. Vulnerable areas had 10 meter high walls, evacuation shelters and marked evacuation routes. Many offices were equipped with earthquake emergency kits. And there were also many early warning systems detecting earthquakes one minute in advance. Emergency and preparedness for earthquakes and tsunamis. There were emergency drills practiced regularly. Despite the planning, however, Japan failed to take into account the impact of the tsunami on a power plant. What was their response? The Japanese government responded immediately. Within 24 hours, 110,000 troops had been mobilized. All TV and radio stations were turned to earthquake coverage to keep people informed and told them what to do. The Bank of Japan offered 183 billion US dollars to Japanese banks so that they could keep operating. They quickly accepted help from rescue and recovery teams from over 20 different countries. Japan's energy policy. Without the nuclear reactor to generate energy, Japan had to start importing fossil fuels. As a result, the price of electricity went up by about 20%. The government's debt level rose because it had to buy in more fossil fuels. Greenhouse gas emissions increased as a result of the increased use of fossil fuels. The events at Fukushima led Germany to shut down all of its nuclear power plants and it pushed up the price of natural gas as the demand also grew. Thank you so much. That is the end of our seventh video. I hope you learned something new. If you would like access to the revision notes that I'm using, there's a link in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe down below, like this video if you enjoyed it or if you're still here. Comment what you learnt or anything. I'd love to get in contact with you. And I will see you in my next video. Same time, same place next week, Monday, 4.30pm. I will see you there.